Brash Upstart Productions is proud to present Tales of the Airship Neverland. Book 2, Captain Hook and the Pirates of Mars. Based on the Airship Neverland books by John R. White. Directed and produced by Michael Shea and John R. White. Before you ask me if I think this story is true, ask me first... If I believe this world is real. Overture, Down the Rabbit Hole, August 1873. Somewhere in the center of the earth lay the Stronachud's Military Development Center. Professor Catherine Hardwick walked about her office, talking into a handheld microphone. She held a hand up to her eyes, blocking the brightness of the glaring inner sun as she looked out the window. She had foolishly forgotten her sunglasses at home. A rather irresponsible thing to do here. With all due respect, sir, you're wrong. Is the neat day? I beg your pardon? On the other end of the conversation was Hardwick's employer, Boris Vladimir Kindak, the Tiger Keen, and Tsar of the Red People. The Red People comprised a militant socialist nation that had no compunction about letting people know that they were bent on global supremacy. The Tsar was known as a hard man to some, and did not suffer fools lightly. Did you just tell me I was wrong? Look, sir, you hired me and sent me down here to the bloody center of the earth to run your project, didn't you? Duh, that I did. But I'm not sure if I made the right decision here. Sounds like you can't keep your people under control. This is why I sent Victor. Is he not helping you enough? This project was critically important to Keane's plans for world domination. Some time ago, he had been informed that the world, previously thought a large solid sphere, was in fact hollow. He had sent an exploration expedition below, and they found a lush land filled with all sorts of living prehistoric creatures. Keane ordered the land seized, and since no one else knew about it, he decided it would be an ideal location for a secret weapons facility. Keane was now paying good money to the gnomes of Mechanopolis and their scientists to develop super weapons. Weapons that would make the Red Nation unquestionably the dominant world superpower. Once every few months, great gyrocopters made the long, dangerous trek to bring down supplies through a pass it had taken years to find. Were it not for that secret uncharted course, the Strana Shoots would not have been possible. Of course, such a complex facility naturally needed competent management. Handpicked for this job, the British Catherine Hartwick was in her early 20s. She had shown great ability at Oxford University, despite what some called a checkered background. Orphaned as a child after her lunatic sister murdered her parents, Catherine grew up in foster homes. However, she was determined to better herself and worked until she was able to flee the shadows of Little Budsworth and the Cheshire Orphanages. Keane's people saw her shining star and the tiger's long claws stretched out with a full doctoral scholarship to bring her to the Red Men's best schools. She could not resist. Upon graduation, Catherine was hired to be the lead project manager of the Inter-Earth operation. But in truth, she felt she had anything but control over it. Keane soon realized that her brashness was also as great as her intellect. Don't be an idiot, Keane. You know that's not what I'm saying. The help is fine. 
Vic's doing a great job. Her assistant, Vic, was helpful and a competent clerk. He was, however, a little weird. What I'm saying is that if you want me to be effective, I need to know everything that is going on down here. Katya, Katya, you know I have the greatest faith in you. This is why I hired you. Right now, all I'm doing is paying the bills and ordering beakers for your mad scientists. Genius is often disguised by madness. You know this. <laughs> yeah, well, a sun that shines for 24 hours a day makes them plenty smart. It also makes them bloody goofy. As she watched the inner earth vista beneath her, a multicolored creature crashed into her window. Oh my god! Its beautiful plumage and striking colors did not hide the nasty row of teeth inside its reptilian maw. Catherine jumped back and shook her head. The flying feathered lizards were no kin to the chirpy budgies that she knew from home. Down below, the military weapons proving grounds were walled off keeping the greater beasties from devouring the scientists, gnome and human alike. It was down there that the greatest military minds worked. The three Irish brothers, Creighton, Goibanu, and Luctanus Smith, were considered godsends to the Tigers' project. The fourth, Moreau, worked underground. And for this, Catherine was profoundly grateful. Moreau scared the living hell out of her. She had her assistant run interference with him, and this kept both of them out of her hair. So, what do you want, Katya? Get to your point, Pusalsta. Okay, fine. Half our supplies are being funneled to one project, yet I have no idea what that project is or what it does. How am I supposed to be able to evaluate progress or success? The tests are beginning today, yes? Noticing a sudden green flash of light, Catherine looked to the distant horizon off to her right. Just now. As she gazed out to that horizon, she saw a large weapons mount on a triangular platform. That was Lutena's project. He labored there attempting to design a mechanical walker and its chief feature, a high-mounted heat beam. The beam's bright light was focused through emeralds, creating a powerful destructive ray. The gems gave it an unearthly verdant aura. However, problems with weapon overheating made the walker uninhabitable for Luktana or anyone else. But the weapon was still promising. Not far from Luktana was his brother Creedon's steambot range. There, the testing agents stood around the metal framework of a large mechanical suit. The bot was meant to be worn as a combat chassis. White clouds of steam puffed out of the giant war machine. Luktana and Creighton's brother Gobi promised some surprises for everyone later that day with his own project. Good. Katya, everything will be fine. You go over to the control tower and today you will learn all there is to know. Good, yes? Yes, sir. Corrosho. Good. Send me a report. Maybe afterwards I send you on a vacation, you and your little man. <laughs> All is good. Thank you, Katya. Catherine took off her headset and shut down the transmitter. She shook her hair out and grabbed her valise. Nodding to herself, she left her office, stepped into the clock tower's elevator, closed the gate, and pushed the lever for the ground floor. While writing down, she allowed herself a cigarette. Smoking was a bad habit she picked up from the Project X main scientist, who, surprisingly, wasn't one of the Smith brothers. Although Catherine was the overall director, she did not oversee personnel matters. The job of directly wrangling the science staff fell to a Dr. Henry Little. The man was, to say the least, odd. Little was a small, scrawny man who was given to speaking in nonsensical poems, and he would randomly grab a female technician and dance around the room if the mood struck him. A widower, Little had brought his lovely daughter with him, and overall he was a sweet man. However, Catherine was not easily amused. She found the man tedious at best, and generally obnoxious. 
As Catherine reached the ground floor, she exited the watchtower and walked across the main campus. As she strode across the field, she flicked the remains of her cigarette away. She would have to get some more this evening. Gobi always had several of the delightful Gaulish inventions, even if he favored the hookah over the convenience of a cigarette for smoking his tobacco. Little's daughter, Allie, was playing in the field as Catherine crossed it. A beautiful little flaxen-haired girl, Allie romped in a cluster of blue butterflies. She waved at Catherine, and Catherine smiled her best smile for the little girl. Returning her wave as she continued walking toward the main control and observation tower at the other end of the concourse. The campus of the Stronischud's facility encompassed 4,000 acres, and a quarter of that space was dedicated to one single project. That project's leader, Gobinu, or Gobi Smith, hadn't given his enterprise a pet name, as his brothers had. Doomsuit was Creedon Smith's project name and death ray seemed to work for Lukta. Gobi's project was simply called Project X. Project X was listed on paper as an ordinary factory building. Inside that building was supposedly an actual working factory, a factory that, according to design specs, would be entirely automated. As Catherine enjoyed her walk, a sooty and greasy young gnome hunted over to her on a small steam-powered tricycle. The gnome promptly handed her a clipboard of papers to be signed. Catherine smiled at him as she took the papers, but she was all business. Well, Jules, has a theoretical engineer signed off on this? Keen wants to know. He says you've ignored his previous inquiries and he wants to know why. Uh, Tesla doesn't know about this little job. How does Nikola Tesla, the leader of the Machinist Guild, not know? Missy, it's like this. If Tesla had been informed about it, he might have said no. And then where would you have been? So if he doesn't know about it, he can't rightly say that, now can he? I, you never heard the saying, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Where are you off to then? Oh, down to see the Prince of Darkness himself. Hello? Aye. The man needs some more power sent his way. I mean, what in God's name is the man doing? Well, I see, I, I've seen things down there. Strange things. Strange people. I swear, last one. One man looked like a pig. I tell you, I mean a real life pig. <laughs> Saying this man was not quite a man and not quite a pig, but somewhere twixt and tween. God. What is Moreau doing? Whatever it is, it's not natural. I honestly don't know, but whatever it is, the Tiger King has approved it all. I try not to pry. To be honest, I don't want to know. Alrighty. Be on for dinner? I'll try. <laughs> Cat, if another one of me meat pies goes bad, you're sleeping on the couch. That should tell you what I think of your meat pies. The little man snorted and pulled away, leaving his lover in his steamy wake. After crossing the field, Catherine came up to one of the taller campus outbuildings, the building housing Gobi Smith's project. She trotted up to the third floor via the outside iron stairway and came to the whitewashed building's office doors. As she approached the automatic doors, they clicked while gears and chains slid them open. Inside, the room's walls were filled with different engines and banks of other calculating devices, the very walls flickering with incandescent tubes. The smell of electricity was acrid in the air as machinery whirred, clicked, ticked, and tucked. Catherine walked toward the project's main operational control room and right into a heated debate. Throughout the room, gnomes ran about, taking care of menial tasks, one of which was preparing a luncheon at a large banquet table. The gnomes poured tea for everyone and filled water pitchers. It was obvious that the gnomes were desperately trying to stay out of the ongoing argument. Catherine moved through the bustling servants. Hello, miss. Good day to you, boss. Catherine accidentally bumped her hip against a small table. 
Something large was on the table. It was covered with a linen cloth. She thought she smelled ginger, but discounted it merely as hunger. She spotted Gobi Smith. He was leaning over the large main drafting table that dominated the room as he slammed his fist repeatedly down on that board, which was covered with blueprints, slide rules, and a very odd copper and brass top hat. The hat was adorned with unlit light bulbs and a small exhaust pipe. On the hat, a small copper coil resided where normally a feather might be. And there was Dr. Little, who was standing off to the side in an effort to distance himself from the ongoing argument. Little was throwing three apples up in the air, seemingly in an effort to catch the apples on his forehead, all the while lecturing Gobi. I cannot and will not subscribe to the interpretation of your data. Little closed his eyes and Catherine watched as the apples descended and landed one upon the other in a small tower on his forehead. <laughs> Gobi turned and slammed his fist into the wall. Catherine jumped and collided with Little. All of his apples crashed to the floor, whereupon he knelt down and picked them up and rose back to his feet. I have gone over the specifications a dozen times, and we can now move forward. Don't have puppies. Jabba is going to work. And must I then, at friendship's call, calmly resign the little all? Fine, fine, so be it. Let us proceed with the test. Little sense of theater struck. He plastered his smile back on, walked over to the drafting table, and lifted the brass hat. Looking it over, he set the hat carefully down on his head. What in the hell is that? Why, this is the very finest of chapeaus, my good woman. This metal, my dear, will control that. Little pointed out the control room window to the factory building. It was located in the middle of what appeared to be a mock uninhabited village. It's a factory. So, what does it make? Make? <laughs> well, what it makes is the answer to war and destruction, madam. Oh, let's do watch. Dr. Little smiled and patted Catherine's shoulder. He leaned over, and the young gnome attached wires to leads built into the back of his head. Little had a brass plate riveted to his skull. Catherine stepped back, slightly nauseated. Little smiled and touched his hand to the brim of his hat. Ma'am? Enough, mate. Let's let her in on our project, eh? What? Indeed. Little nodded, and the gnome snapped the last lead onto his head plate. With that, the light bulb in his hat lit up and the coils sparked with a sickening greenish light. Out in the middle of the mock village sat the factory building, detailed right down to wagons, stores, vehicles, and even a bell tower. Catherine noticed the factory shake and vibrate. She could hear it creak, moan, and sigh as, as if something was happening to it. There was a rumbling growl. The great factory shifted its position with a shriek of metal and a howl of steam and smoke. A dust cloud formed around it, and it exploded up from the ground. There was a whoosh of air as the building moved and displaced several thousand square feet of the still atmosphere. Great streams of dirt and soil spilled down, and the factory now stood up on two pairs of giant legs. Oh my God! The building looked like a monstrous cast iron and brick crab. The factory's two forward claws snapped. As it turned slightly, Catherine could see that the back of the building also had two appendages, but they were slightly different. Whereas the front claws were crustacean in appearance, the back claws were more human-like, though equally large. A quartet of legs the size of giant church clock towers ended in metal elephantine feet, and the body of the factory now stood over the mock town below, eclipsing it from the eternal sunlight above. She's up! Do you have control, Henry? I do. Little took a couple of short steps, and the great factory building mimicked him. 
How are you doing that? My thought waves are connected to the factory's living brain. Little winked at Catherine. And out on the field, one of the factory's round upper windows flashed back in a flirty harmony. You built a brain. Of course not. We didn't build a brain. Who builds brains? It needed a brain. And of course, since it didn't have one, one would need to get one. Don't you have a brain? Of course I do. Everyone has a brain. I could argue that, especially to a politician. <laughs> really, Henry? Can we begin? Wait. You made a walking factory. Why? Ah, yes. Why? Madam, the great problem with war is the mess afterwards. You see, what we have here is a weapon that cleans up after itself. You have got to be putting me on. Partially, partially. But I ask you, when is a weapon not a weapon? What? Whenever you don't want it to be. <laughs> You see, my dear, what we have is a machine that takes debris and can remake it to whatever needs fashioning. Then we can have it walk to wherever it needs to go. Right. Of course. Let's test this. Hans? Little closed his eyes, moved his hands up and down, and then closed them. The great claws of the factory moved in unison with Little's hands, and then snapped shut. Working. Now the mouth. Little moved over to the smaller table that was covered with the linen cloth. A gnome moved away the cloth, revealing a small gingerbread village. Testing. With his hands, Little tore apart the pastry hamlet. Outside, the factory began to do the same, and as Little moved the gingerbread pieces to his mouth, the industrial crustacean began mimicking him. Little <laughs> giggled, shoveling his mouth full quickly munching the destroyed baked goods. Catherine looked outside and saw the iron crustacean destroy the town's buildings and shovel them into its own fiery maw. Holy mother of God, it's eating the town. Yes. In fact, not only is it eating the town, what it is actually doing is using the materials to fire its furnaces. Then it breaks down the debris and processes the material to maintain itself or fashion anything else as needed. So it's a perpetual motion machine? Not quite, but close, real close. Little was having a grand time, showing off and convorting about the room. Outside, following Little's movements, the factory was destroying the town's buildings with graceful automatonish glee, moving through the faux village and demonstrating its full range of motion. Catherine was actually amazed at what a walking five-story factory could do. Even the gnomes went to the window to watch intently. That's some crazy shenanigans. I so want to send that to my mother-in-law's house. Little wasn't paying attention to anything at all in the room. Without noticing, he backed into the banquet table that was set for lunch. The food and drinks were scattered and the table collapsed. Little placed one hand on his hat as he fell backward into a large, ever-growing puddle that formed where a china teapot had spilled and shattered, sending hot Earl Grey everywhere. With a resounding thud, he landed in the scalding brown liquid. <coughs> he attempted to leap up, but he slipped and slammed his metal hat into one of the giant temperance engines. The brass and copper hat caused the calculating device to short, and as he was still scrambling about in the tea, he completed a circuit causing electricity to shoot through him. Henry Little screamed and shuddered horribly. Goby ran to his aid, and in a moment of panic, forgetting everything he knew about the rules of electrical conductivity, grabbed Little. The electric jolt threw him off. The light flickered, first in the room, then throughout the building, and finally over the entire campus. And everything suddenly went dark and quiet. Outside, the great factory shuddered and ceased moving. The sudden quiet was interrupted only by Little's heavy breathing and moaning. The room began to fill with heavy smoke. Catherine moved to help Little and Gobi, but suddenly she stopped, turned her head, and cocked her ear. Outside, there came a horrible roar and rumble. The 
Jordan slowly looked out the window. The great factory was moving again, although slowly and a bit unsurely. The factory had gone momentarily silent when Little was shot, but now its front doors opened wide and its furnaces blazed brightly with even greater fires. The factory building, which was no longer mimicking Little's movements, almost appeared to be considering what to do. Oh no. Oh, this is bad. Oh, pour some salt water over the floor. Ugly, I'm sure you won't even allow it to be. Little tried to push himself off the floor, but his eyes rolled back in his head and he thudded back down. Gobi shook his head and stood up, moving to Catherine's side. They watched as the factory wobbled and then turned toward their general direction. It slowly began to move forward, its claws scooping up everything in its path. Screams erupted as the campus technicians ran for their lives. Then something quite extraordinary happened. Catherine watched as a green flash of light struck the factory. From one of the other testing grounds, a great tripod rose up on telescoping legs. The great wedge had a giraffe-like neck which rose up, and from the head of the mechanical beast, a brilliant emerald beam fired. Lutena, realizing his brother's project had gone renegade, now engaged the rogue factory building with his death ray. Catherine smiled slightly as she watched. She hoped to witness a great battle. The heat ray struck one of the factory's smokestacks and blew it apart. The moving building spun on its axis in the direction of Lugtena's tripod. Lugtena had not yet corrected his machine's thermal output issues, but he sat in its cockpit located on the main tripod, leaving the cockpit canopy open to provide cool air. Working the control levers, he moved the vehicle in the direction of the factory. Lovely, lovely, lovely. This is not exactly how I planned on showing you off today, my wee band. He moved his hands over the dashboard, manipulating a control treadle that charged the flywheel. Over the sounds of the tripod's movement and the industrial carnage being created by the moving factory, Lutano was bathed in the high-pitched whine of charging electricity as he watched a green light flicker into brilliance and stabilize into a bright glow. All right, my lassie doll. Let's show this big building it's not nice to eat people, shall we? As soon as the light steadied, he squeezed a trigger on his controller. The ray fired again and struck the factory on the front door, blowing huge sections of the factory's facade off. The building howled in agony, smoke gushing out of the holes, and its windows illuminated with an angry red light. Dear God, Gobi! What hath they wrought? Lutena wiped his brow. The flywheel was flooding the cockpit with untenable ambient heat. He spun the charging wheel again and kept his eyes on the factory as it seemed to ready itself. He furrowed his brow, observing the back of the building rise up as the front lowered. Wait, what? Oh no. The factory crouched and then sprang forward on all four legs, launching itself toward the tripod. Catherine was dumbfounded. She was watching a building pounce. Sweet Lord in heaven. Lutena slammed the control lovers hard over, desperately attempting to steer the vehicle out of the way of the attacking factory. But the cockpit was too hot and the control hydraulics were failing, gaskets leaking like sieves. As the factory landed and grabbed the tripod in both claws, a screaming Lutena squeezed the trigger one last time and managed to fire one more shot at the factory, point blank. The ray went straight down the factory's gullet, striking an internal furnace. The great pincers crushed the tripod. The last thing Lutena saw was a swath of jade flames that set his flesh on fire. Catherine stepped back, watching the factory's two great claws shove the tripod into its maw, bolting the vehicle down, Smith Brother and all. Wow. That's just... poor. Mother of God, what the hell type of brain did you give it? Little's dog, Jabber. 
Great Danes are supposed to be very good with kids. They both watched as the factory building scratched behind its front smokestack with its front leg. Bruce, did that just... Yep. I sure hope it doesn't have to take a piss. Here comes Creedon. Creedon Smith had worked meticulously on his mechanical suit, his bot. Each shoulder had a mounted revolver that fired three one-inch diameter shells. The suit had a belt containing a number of utility devices, reloads for its shoulder guns, grappling hooks, small bombards, and repair kits. Creedon was positive he would be able to bring down the beast. He had donned the steam-powered flying bot, took a great running leap, and launched himself into the air. Once airborne, he leaned to one side and then the other, satisfying himself that the suit was flying correctly. He had armed the weapons and checked that the shoulder-mounted cannons articulated perfectly. Creighton would mourn his brother later. There was no time now. He flew up alongside the factory building and hovered as he assessed the target. All right, then. Feeling hell, this is a big goddamn building. The building seemed to stare back at him. The awnings in the upper window lowered halfway, and the building issued forth a low, rumbling growl. Oi, look here, you monstrous git. You don't get to kill me, brother, and get away with it now. Creedon hesitated, wondering if the factory was about to retreat. But with ungodly speed, the building spun back around to face him. The next thing Creedon saw was a giant black claw. Bugger me. Everyone in the project office watched in horror as the building quickly and simply swatted the flying man sending him two miles away, tumbling through the air. Oh, sweet mother of God! It used a gambit! Not possible! That's not possible! The factory turned to face the observers once again. Stretching its front legs out, it raised its hindquarters up and spewed a long stream of fire. Then it howled at the sun. <laughs> What? Yo, Hume. The gnome Bruce, the project site maintenance manager, grabbed Little, shaking and slapping him. <laughs> Little roused and stared at him. Bruce hitched a thumb in the direction of the incoming, tripod-eating, fire-spewing, steam-bot-swatting industrial plant. Jabber's wonky, bud. Might want to do something. Jabber's wonk. wonky. Yes, okay. Oh, look at the time, Gibbet. We're off the clock. Bye! We had a delightful time. Thanks for the lovely massacre. So sorry, mustache. Huh. Huh. What the hell do you mean by huh? Yeah, about that. There could be a problem. I suppose we might want to run, too. What about him? Henry? We're going to run, you know. Flee. Hide? <laughs> oh, he's staying. <laughs> Gobi shrugged. With that, he looked out the window. The factory building was now a mere hundred yards away and looming ever larger. It stopped advancing for a moment and was doing something with its claw. It reached into its great maw of a furnace. Catherine could not help but stare. Oh, this cannot be by any stretch of the imagination good. The factory hacked up a colossal piece of burning debris under the ground looked at it, picked it up, and threw it at the project building. As it hurtled toward them, an entranced Catherine was quite certain that the burning wreckage was Creedon's tripod. Duck! Gobi hurled himself to the floor. The debris struck the building below them. The project building shuddered and swayed, and sections of the roof began to rain down on them. Catherine was thrown backwards by the impact. She shook her head and began to yell at the last remaining Smith brother. Did it just throw the tripod at us? Did that thing just vomit up your brother and throw 
freaking actress? Henry Little, tell the damn thing to stop! <laughs> Yo, Jabba! Here, boy! Here, boy! No! The factory closed its claws on the project building, tearing at the roof. The office shook, and debris showered down about them. The roof was rent asunder, and great chunks of it rained down. This is all wrong! Tell me something I don't know! Gobi looked at Catherine. Then he looked upwards as sunlight poured into the room. The huge roof had vanished, and the factory building was now looking down at them. Look at Java! I'll do the little factory grow! Bugger this! Expecting the mammoth claws to gobble them all up, Gobi bolted crazily out of the door to the outside stairway. Don't leave me here! Not just me, us! Gilby, beware the Jabberwocks, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the Jumpjum, shun the enemy's bandits. What the hell are you on about? Stop that damnable thing! Oh, hush up a bit, I have a terrible headache. Little shook his head and tried to fiddle with his hat. Oh good, lovely, it's stuck. Well, at least the wind won't go so. With that, he turned his gaze upward and stared at the looming factory, which suddenly stopped moving. Its great burning windows and smoking maw seemed to stare back at Little. The room filled with foul-smelling smoke that stung Catherine's eyes. Her mouth went slack as she watched Little stagger about drunkenly, yelling at the monstrous building. In upper thought he stood. The Jabberwonk, with eyes aflame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. Lovely! I'm depending on a maniac to save me! Henry Little put his hands on his hips and weaved about as he continued to dress down the factory. The great beast opened its mouth and breathed the blast of superheated air at Henry and Catherine. Both of them staggered under the blast, now instantly bathed in sweat. Stop your bloody whiffling and bubbling! Oddly, the building hesitated and closed its greater doors, but its iron crab claws kept a firm grip on the office walls. Little grabbed a carving knife from the floor amidst the mess of the buffet table. He slashed the knife through the air. One, two, one, two, and through. I'm through! The vocal blade went snigger snack! Don't make me come up there and snigger snack you! Catherine watched the man and the animated factory interact. As if startled, the factory flinched backwards, and as it moved backwards, it tore huge portions of the project building away with it. Outside, Gobi was running down the iron stairway, taking many steps at a time. A great metallic moaning surrounded him, and the stairway shuddered. He saw and felt the motion beneath his feet as the stairway slowly separated from the building. Whole sections of wall crumbled, gave way, and hurtled toward him. Gobi threw himself toward the stairway's second floor landing, but he was a moment too late. A large section of the falling wall struck the landing first, collapsing it. The twisted metal buckled, and the entire stairway broke completely away from the building. The last Smith brother fell screaming to the ground, landing on the soft earth. For a moment, he thought he would walk away in one piece from the fall, but the section of falling brickwork crushed him. He felt a flash of agony as his spine snapped, and then... nothing. Inside the building, Little continued yelling at the retreating factory. Oh, bugger off! For a moment, the building hesitated, seemed to hang its head, and then shuffled off slowly, like a scolded lapdog. Little stood in the breach of the collapsed wall where the window had been, his hands on his hips, wearing a stern expression. He watched as the monstrous factory building turned and took one more mournful look back at him, its great claws hanging down at its sides. I said off with you, you great bumbling jabberwock! The 
factory slunk off, and there was a long, slow, mournful wail from its steam whistle. Catherine ran to the open door to the outside stairway and caught herself before falling. She looked down at the debris of iron stairs, bricks, and plaster and saw Gobi buried beneath the rubble. Henry! We have to help him! Help me find a way down! Little joined Catherine and looked down at Gobi. Little's hat whistled sadly as he looked down making its own mournful king. He certainly doesn't look very mimsy, does he? Were I able to doff my hat, I would. Gobi! Consider that a sincere doffing! All right, sir! Dead man remained still and said nothing. Right! Good man! Is that better, Miss Hardwick? Catherine looked around the room for some means of egress then noticed Little's gaze turn suddenly back to the outside. Little stuck out his lower lip and opened his hands in a look of bewilderment. Catherine followed his gaze to see what he was looking at when, out of nowhere, a huge white jackrabbit, wearing a blue suit coat and vest, leaped through the open roof and landed in the middle of the floor. The smartly dressed rabbit looked at Catherine with big pink eyes straightened its reading spectacles, smiled, and wiggled its pink nose. And a pleasant day to you, ma'am. Catherine simply couldn't handle any more of this insanity. She smiled meekly at the rabbit as she sank into unconsciousness and collapsed slowly into a still-smiling heap on the floor. Oh, heavens! Oh, my, oh, me! Terribly sorry! Was it something I said? Little reached into his vest pocket and looked at his pocket watch, shaking his head sadly. You're late. <gasps> oh, dear. She's a tad overwrought. Burdens of command and all that. Turning away from Catherine slumped on the floor, Little calmly bent over, picked up a shattered china cup, and, finding a still warm teapot, poured himself a cup of tea. He gestured to the rabbit. Have some. No, thank you. Dr. Moreau sent me to help. Your daughter, Alice, is safe with Master Vern. Excellent, excellent. <sighs> I should think our work is done here. A agreed. Tales of the Airship Neverland Book 2 Captain Hook and the Pirates of Mars this has been a Brash Upstart production. Based on the Tales of the Airship Neverland books by John R. White. Audio screenplay adapted by John R. White. Produced and directed by Michael Shea and John R. White. Featuring the voices of Tony Semenik, Christine Peruski, Tom Pelletieri, Chris Williams, Michael Shea, Stephen John Bryan White, Mark Speck, Eric Johnson, Joan Buford, and John R. White. Recorded at the Actors Loft in Royal Oak, Michigan. Editing by Christopher Williams and John R. White. To find out more about Tales of the Airship Neverland and to purchase the books themselves, visit www.airshipneverland.com.